Diego be here at the weekend. I would encourage you, let's stand together. Scripture says, let us worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Right? We think about creation is so beautiful, but then we need to remember the one who created it all. And that his beauty that gathers us here this morning, his beauty in Christ, the salvation that we have. So I'd encourage you this morning just to begin to prepare your hearts and minds to, uh, to worship and to praise him. Uh, put aside any distractions and really begin to turn our attention to the Lord this morning. So let's, let's sing together, inviting him to, uh, to be welcome with us on our praise.
good morning again. Such a happy sound. So many smiles. Love those greetings. Good morning. My name is Rebecca, and it's my honor to serve as the worship pastor here at South Bend First. And I'd like to tell you about a few ways you can participate in the life of South Bend First Church of the Nazarene, which, of course, is the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, so first of all, we have, coming up next weekend, a membership class. And we would love for you to come over and join us for this time. Uh, during this time, you'll learn about how the Church of the Nazarene fits within the global church, fits within the Church of Jesus Christ, and also what makes the Church of Nazarene distinct as a denomination. So if you'd like to know more about that, we'd love to have you. And next, next Sunday, following the service, lunch is provided. And there's more information there in the bulletin. If this is something that interests you, just... Uh, notate that on the yellow connection card. Also, we have a fun event for the women coming up on November 9th, Saturday. Uh, Trudy Thornburg has been so generous to open her home. It's for a Women's Day Out, or some might call it a Women's Day In. We're going to hang out, enjoy some fellowships, some tacos. We'd love to have you out. Um, there's information about how to RSVP there. And I would just encourage you ladies, if you have a friend, if you know a woman who needs some encouragement, invite her along. Or, or if you know a woman who does not have a relationship with Jesus, maybe she is struggling or she needs to know the Lord, that would be a great friend to bring. So consider bringing a friend to that as well. And lastly, um, after service, if you are new to us or you are just visiting, if you're just new in the last month or visiting, we pastors would love to get to know you. So we invite you to stop by the connection table. It's right outside these doors. We'd love to greet you, get to know a little bit about you, and we also have a discipleship resource gift that we'd like to give to you. And then I understand that Miss Sandy also has. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a little reminder that um, October, unfortunately, and as quickly as it has come, it is coming to an end. Um, so Pastor Appreciation Month will end on the 31st, so this weekend and through this Thursday, if you have anything that you would like to pass along to the pastors, if you could get that to me by Thursday, that would be great. And then on November 3rd, we'll present all that to the pastors, so thank you for all that. We've got quite a, a gift giving already, so I appreciate that. So. I just forgot about one more announcement as well. Uh, we have been enjoying the women's class on Wednesday nights. We've been enjoying Pastor D. She's been teaching. This coming Wednesday, we do not have women's class. However, we invite you ladies to join to, into the Come to the Water class. We'd love to have you there. And the women's class will continue the following Wednesday. And I understand Barbie will be offering some instruction. We're going to be learning about the life of Rachel. So we'd love to have you out that. At this time, we'd like to invite the ushers forward as we begin to prepare our hearts for offering to the Lord. Lord God, you are the great provider. You always give exactly what is needed, exactly when it is needed. You're so good to us, always graciously and mercifully giving. You're so generous, Lord. And it's our honor to express our worship to you by bringing your tithes and our offerings into the storehouse, God. And we trust and know that you will use these to further your kingdom, that you will use them for your purposes. And so we bring them with humble hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're reminded in Revelation 1, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. Micah then reminds us about this millennial reign. It reminds us we will beat the swords into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. What, what a day to look forward to. No more witchcraft, no more high places where um, actual pools, they're all going to be torn down. God wants a relationship with us, and he just reminds us at the end of Micah to act justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly.
say, God, this is what I'm dealing with. This is my need this week. Or I'm praying for somebody. Or you'd like somebody to pray with you. I want to invite you to come as we sing this last verse. Let's sing it together. God, we lift up a few who we know and love, and we pray for your mercy on them. We think of Kristen, so we see God who has lost her father, and we don't pray just for her, but for her entire family, that you would comfort them with only the comfort that you can bring, and then that they would recognize that this comfort comes from you, God. And we also lift up Roseanne as she's had stroke. Lord, would you minister her, minister to her right now in this moment? She may be feeling physical pain. She may be feeling fear. But you're capable of comforting her, Lord. Would you do that right now in this moment? And there are many others who need your touch, God. You know each one. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts and minds now to hear your word through Pastor Mandy. We lift him up and pray that you would embolden him to speak truth, to speak love, to clearly communicate your word as you have ordained him to do. And open our hearts to receive it, Lord. 
In Jesus' name we pray. And we lived as neighbors as, as I want to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamist attackers. Guns started firing and we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed or driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to put on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians and the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burned to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remain are the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability continues. <laughs> Delivering desperately needed help to displaced Christians often means overcoming impassable roads using cargo planes, trucks, motorcycles, bicycles, and even canoes. With God's help, supplies are making it to Christians scattered throughout various camps. Today, Jeanette and more than 30,000 Christians in the Central African Republic have been driven from their homes, all because of their faithfulness in maintaining a witness for Christ in majority Muslim areas in the face of severe Islamist violence. These courageous believers, our Christian brothers and sisters in the Central African Republic, have shown God's love and forgiveness to their persecutors. They continue to faithfully follow the Lord and trust Him to meet their needs. Well, it's a sobering reminder, isn't it, of what uh, our brothers and sisters in the Lord experience around the world uh, while we sit here in peace and safety, right? Well, next week, uh, November 3rd, is uh, Sunday uh, for prayer for Christian martyrs and those in danger around the world. So I want to invite you to be here next week as we join in prayer for that. Our missions team here has uh, put together, well, they didn't put together, but... Uh, <laughs> got the uh, video for us to watch, and we'll have some reminders next week that'll help guide us in prayer. So I want you to be here for that. But uh, how many of you think that what we just saw and what those uh, Christians are going through there in the Central African Republic, how many of you think that is God's intention for uh, believers around the world? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Of course not. Of course that's not God's intention for us, is it? God's intention for us it is for us to live the way that he intended when he created us, to live in peace, right? To live in safety, to live in security. God, in his created order, it tells us that he created us, everything was good, and that he blessed his creation, and that he told us to be fruitful, that we were to live in peace, and we were to live, as we heard earlier, uh, peaceful, just, and righteous lives. I have a map here that shows where Christians around the world 
are facing uh, the most persecution. Now, there may be persecution in other countries, but these are the top 10 areas around the world where Christians face the most persecution. You can see it spread across uh, much of uh, Northern Africa, uh, the Middle East, and then uh, large parts of Asia there where Christians face persecution. And then this next map tells us, shows us kind of where that persecution is taking place, what the, the primary ideology is of those areas that is uh, the source of the persecution. So uh, in the orange there, you have Buddhist uh, society that is persecuting Christians. Uh, the red is communist. Uh, the orange, or I'm sorry, the yellow rather, is Hindu extremists. The green is Islamist ex extremism. And then uh, the purple is other um, ideologies or whatever that might be uh, persecuting Christians. And as we look at that, what becomes evident is that most persecution occurs in countries where there is very little Judeo-Christian influence, right? Uh, not only uh, are there um, Christians that are persecuted, but, but many other people from other religions, uh, non-dominant religions, will also experience persecution in those areas. That's not to say that Christianity's record is spotless when it comes to talking about persecution and violence like that. Of course it's not. But in general, Christianity, the Judeo-Christian way, ethic, biblical way, uh, in general tends to lead to more freedom in people's lives. I have some other maps here that I wanted to show. This is uh, just, just a variety of maps. The Freedom Index. So the countries that are dark uh, blue or, or that color uh, experience the most freedom. Those in the other colors uh, experience less freedom. Uh, the next map here shows uh, this is uh, travel, where it's safe to travel. And so you can see the lighter the green, take normal security precautions just like you would whenever you travel. And then the, uh, the, the yellow, orange, and red, again, is, are more dangerous areas. Um, this is where women have uh, more rights. And so they experience a lot more freedom and have more rights in their lives. This next one is income level. So where income and, and uh, prosperity is... And again, you can see the correlation between places that are free and are also influenced by Judeo-Christianity and, and those that are not, by other ideologies or other religions. You can see there's a much higher level of income. Global education, again, very similar. Uh, very high levels of education for children all the way through college in uh, places where Christianity has had a great impact. Then you also have freedom of the press, right? Where people are able to for, for uh, more or less at times, get uh, a, a clear picture of what's going on in their country. My contention to you this morning in, in talking about this and looking at these maps and exploring this is that these freedoms and blessings arise and persist wherever Christianity and biblical ethics and morality has been allowed to influence the civic religious, social, educational, and governmental institutions of a nation. Wherever that has been allowed to flourish, those people have prospered in freedom, economically, educationally, health-wise. The scripture tells us this, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked gain power, the people Grown. Now, this kind of freedom, this kind of blessing that happens in these lands that are influenced to a great extent by Judeo Christianity, uh, this does not happen in a vacuum, right? It's not something that's conjured out of thin air. It's not just something that, that we, uh, we make good wishes and just hope that it happens, sending happy thoughts. But it occurs only when the people of God implement and exercise their Christian beliefs, right? Their biblical ethics and morality. And so the freedoms and blessings and benefits that are in undeniably present, as we've just seen, in, in very specific continents and countries in our world, they have grown and flourished wherever Christian thought and people have influenced and permeated the civic, religious, social, educational, and governmental institutions. That type of flourishing happens when Christians are involved. In other words, when they are involved in the politics of the world, 
That has brought blessing to the most people. Amen? Amen. The Bible also says this, that righteousness will exalt the people, but sin diminishes the people. And I like that translation. It's the Aramaic, uh, what is it, the Aramaic uh, Bible something, uh, Bible people's translation or something like that. But I like how it says, uh, translates that, that righteousness exalts people, but sin diminishes them. In other words, it makes them less. It, it, it makes their lives worse. It, it brings them down. And so when we live in a place where God's righteousness is exalted, people are blessed. But where sin, other ideologies, non-biblical ideologies reign, often people's lives are diminished. I think that that means that Christians should be involved in politics to answer the question on the front of your bulletin today. Now, what do I mean by that? Politics. What is politics? Okay. Politics, this is Merriam-Webster's definition, is the total complex of relations between people living in a society. Okay. The total complex of relations, all the relationships that we have, all of those relationships, how we interact with one another and in the variety of ways that we do that, all of those things of us living together in society, the way we relate, that is politics. Okay? Politics is not just what happens every four years okay? in a presidential election. It's how we interact with one another and how we govern ourselves and the laws that govern us and the relations that we have with one another. And I think by that definition, then, we could say that everything is politics. Can't we? In some ways, right? Everything is politics because everything relates to how we relate to each other, how we get along. And I think that by that definition, that we can even say in the Bible, if we include our relationship to God, even the Bible is political. Even the Bible is involved with. Uh, and speaks about politics it, because it speaks about the total complex of relations between people and God and people and each other, right? So politics is not something we should be afraid of. It's not something that Christians should avoid. I've been seeing some, you know, Facebook memes going around and people trying to drive a wedge between Christians and the political sphere, right? We, 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 should, we're just, we only serve the kingdom, right? We don't, we're not involved in politics. That's not biblical. <laughs> it might sound nice. It might sound good. It's what we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, that false teaching that sounds good on its face, but it's just simply not biblical because the Bible talks about the complex relations between people and between people and each other and people and God. And so how do we relate to each other? That is political, right? We see it all throughout Scripture. I got a few examples up here on the, uh, the, uh, the screen. Uh, we have the Ad Adamic covenant. That's when uh, God created Adam and Eve. He put them in the garden. And, and everything was perfect. He had a perfect relationship between God and humans, between humans and one another, right? That's how we relate to each other. There's a, there's a political element there. Again, not elections necessarily, but, but how we relate. Then there was the Abrahamic covenant where God said to the, to the Israelites, I will be your God and you will be my people. How we relate to each other. And then that extended, uh, went on then into the Mosaic Covenant, right? Which we read about in Exodus and Leviticus. And it starts with the Ten Commandments. And God said, this is how you're to govern yourself. This is going to make you a distinct people amongst all the peoples of the world as you obey me and follow my commandments. And then we have Leviticus and the Levitical Law uh, that, ex that uh, expounded on how to live out those Ten Commandments and how to relate to God. It was political, right? Then you have the Prophets. And the prophets came along, and the prophets would often remind the people uh, where they drifted away from God, where they had not been living faithfully in their relationship to God, especially expressed how they related to each other, right? So we read so often there in the prophets, it talks about where, uh, you know, they would oppress the poor, or they would mistreat people, or they would, they would carry out injustices, right? Uh, and so the prophets, God sent the prophets to remind them, listen, this is how you're to live. Remember how I called you to live to be my people. That's political. The Sermon on the Mount, very, very political, talking about divine and human relationships, how we relate to God, how we relate to one another. And then, really, the rest of the New Testament itself, all of the Bible, but the rest of the New Testament talking about how we relate to each other in civic ways, right? 
how we relate to government, how we relate to authorities and institutions, and, and, and then church relationships, how we relate to one another in church. Everywhere you look in scripture, the total complex of relations between people and each other and people and God is of primary concern, right? If you disagree, you can talk about it with me later. I'd love to hear about it. But, but as I read it, I see that, that politics is, is intertwined in everything. And so as Christians, if we are to be people who are following after God's word, we are to be engaged in the political realms of our world. As Christians living in America today, just like Christians living throughout the centuries, we have the opportunity, and I believe the biblical responsibility, to not only live personally ethical lives. In other words, we should live uh, according to scripture in our personal lives, the way that we live. To not only pray for our leaders in our country, we should always be doing that, right? Praying for, for them to do the right thing, praying for the safety of our country. But then we are to also exercise wisdom, righteousness, justice, mercy, goodness, and truth by participating in the political processes we've been blessed to inherit from our Judeo-Christian ancestors. We saw it on the maps just a few minutes ago. The places where Christians have engaged in the political realm, where they have exercised biblical influence in the world, in their countries, amongst their peoples, in their tribes and villages, the people experience blessing. Where they have not done that, where other ideologies and other religions dominate, people have often experienced great suffering and hardship. And so to do so, to exercise our Christianity, our faith in, a, in the political sphere, I believe is to do it consistently with the teachings and revelation of Scripture. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount I just mentioned a few minutes ago. Jesus is teaching uh, his followers, if you're going to follow me, this is what you're going to be, this is what you're like. And you might, you'll be familiar with this passage. He says this, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in that house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's think about that for a moment. What is Jesus saying to us here in this passage, right? The salt and the light that he mentions, they're not just symbols. He's not just speaking symbolically or metaphorically, is he? They're not just symbols. Instead, they give us clear insight into how we should live as his followers. Think about salt for a minute. What does salt do? Right? Uh, Terry and I were talking just earlier. He's talking, we were singing about the fire, God's fire. Let your fire fall down and how fire can be a purifying thing. Well, one of the things that salt does is that it, it disinfects, right? It disinfects what it touches. It pre uh, preserves that which it touches. It enhances. And it creates thirst, right? Salt disinfects, enhances, preserves, and creates thirst. Now, how does it do that? Salt doesn't do that by sending good thoughts and wishes, does it? <laughs> to that steak that's sitting there, right? Or to that uh, whatever you're trying to preserve, right? Of course not. Salt has to come into contact with that with which it is going to interact, right? Salt has to enter into the, the wound. It has to enter into uh, or cover and uh, around that, uh, let's say, preserving meat like they used to do, right? It, it, has to, it has to be put on your food for you to be able to taste it, right? And in the same way, followers of Jesus, he calls us salt. And so if we are to uh, have the impact that salt has in our world, we're, we have to enter in, we have to engage, and we have to participate in the politics 
right? The expression, the way that we relate to one another, we have to enter into that in a real and tangible way. And when we do that, when we enter into that as salt, when we actually participate in the processes of the world, then we can, through the word of God and his spirit, we enhance, we preserve that which is right and true. We disinfect, right, that which is sinful and wrong and unrighteous and unjust. And as we live out our faith before others, we create thirst in them, a thirst and a hunger for something different, for a different way. Right? That's why so many people are drawn to the faith, not only here, but around the world. They see there's something different between what they have in their country or their religion and what Christianity offers to them. In the same way, light, I'm not going to go on here, the sermon's not about salt and light per se, but, but light, what does it do? It illuminates it clarifies, it brings comfort, and it dispels darkness, but it can only do that when it's shining, right? It only does that when it, it turns its light on those areas. The Christians who came before us knew this. They understood what Jesus' teaching tells them about being salt and light in the world. They knew that they had to engage. They knew that they had to participate and be active in the political processes of their world. And that's what changed great swaths of the continents of this earth, as we saw in very tangible ways on these maps, that, that lives are dynamically changed, not just spiritually, but just in very practical ways. So... How can we be salt and light? How can we bring kingdom values to bear if we do not engage? If we do not participate, we cannot be salt and light. What, look what Jesus says here about salt if it's not engaging or if it loses its saltiness. We're not talking about salty like salty language here, by the way. <laughs> uh, if salt, in other words, if salt doesn't do what salt does... It is no longer good for anything. That's quite an indictment, isn't it? If you as a Christian, or if I as a Christian, am not engaged in bringing kingdom values, kingdom ethics, God's way, and his kingdom into our world in ways consistent with scripture, if I'm not involved in doing that, I'm like salt that has lost its flavor. I'm good for nothing. In the same way, light Light is not, you don't put a light under a bowl. You, you don't hide that light. You don't choose to withdraw from society and disengage. No, we engage. We let our light shine into our world. And so the light of Christianity it, it, it impacts, right, law and jurisprudence. It impacts health and science and education and, and all of these kinds of parts of society, right? And it influences them and it brings blessing into our world. In, in fact, Jesus goes on and he says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, that you might act in God's way in this world. We cannot and we should not abdicate being salt and light in our world. Amen? Amen. Whew, am I hitting a nerve? <laughs> so, should Christians participate in politics? I believe Scripture teaches, from what I've shared this morning, if you have a different perspective, I'd love to hear it. I believe Scripture from beginning to end is unqualifiably yes. We should be engaged. We should be active. We should be participating. I heard this week, I don't know if I kept my sticky note here. Let me see if I can find my... I was going to write it down. I mean, I was going to put it down. I thought I was listening to a, a message this week, uh, a black pastor. He was speaking at a conference and he said this. I thought this was so powerful. He was talking about Christians and their influence in the world. He says, I don't care what you believe. I don't care what you believe. Show me what you're willing to fight for, what you're willing to open your mouth and put yourself out there for. 
We, we, can, we can say all the nice platitudes that we want. We can, we can teach, you know, all these good things. We can say all these things. Christians should be this way. We should, you know, and our country should be this way. But until you're willing to put yourself out there, until you're willing to open your mouth and actually put your reputation on the line, do you really believe it? It was a convicting message to me. So I want to spend the last few minutes we have together. If we are to be involved, if we are to participate in the political process and the civic processes of our country and have a direct and clear and profound influence, just like our ancestors who walk the faith have, if we're to do that, what does that look like? How should we be engaged in our world of society and bring the blessing that comes with that? How do we do that? Well... I want to say a few things about that. First of all, I want to say this uh, from Scripture. Uh, that first of all, when we talk about politics, when we talk about the way that we work in the world, and when we think specifically about things like elections in our country, we need to remember that first and foremost, our absolute and ultimate allegiance is to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? That is our first Allegiance, that is our first priority. And so whenever we engage, whenever we do participate, we do not do so as citizens of this world, but as citizens of the world that is yet to come. With that in mind, with that perspective in mind, with a biblical perspective in mind. Uh, scripture says this, you shall have no other gods before me. All right? So we don't make a god of politics. We don't make a god of Presidents. We don't make a god of, you know, whatever. Just like we'd say, we wouldn't do that of celebrities or athletes. Uh, we shall have no other gods before him. He is our highest and absolute authority. And if it comes down to, uh, 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 you know, the politics or a government that is evil and asks us to do evil things, just like Peter said when he stood before the Sanhedrin, he said, we must obey God rather than men. That's our ultimate allegiance, Okay. So you don't hear anything else I say, make sure you hear that. Or make sure you hear everything I say in that context, okay? Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. We are only serving one master, and that is God. Second, our trust must be in God, not humans, to save us. So no matter how good our political leaders are, ultimately they, they can't save us. Okay, from sin. They can't save us from ourselves. Now, uh, they can uh, enact laws that help society to work in a better way, that, that preserve freedom and peace in our world, right? But they cannot save us. Only God must be our absolute trust to save us. And I love this passage. Psalm 146 says this. Do not put your trust in princes. Okay, today we might say, do not put your trust in government or in, uh, you know, Senators or presidents, whatever. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing, right? Plans, you know, laws will come and go. Nations will come and go. But blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. So, our trust is only in God. We don't trust the government to fix the world's problems. We don't trust the government to fix our problems. The government can do good things, but it is not uh, our, our, what we put our faith and trust in. Third, then, moving along. we got a lot more to go. <laughs> uh, Christians should seek to bring godly influence to bear on society in order to bless it. God's our primary allegiance. We put our trust in him and him alone. But then we are also to be salt and light, right? Jeremiah 29, 7 says this. Seek the peace and well-being for the city where I have sent you into exile. He's talking there to the, the people that had been cast out of their land. But he says, when you go there, seek the peace and well-being of that place. And pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its peace, or its well-being, you will have peace. As followers of, of Christ, as people who are kingdom people, we are to pray and to seek the to pray for and seek the peace and well-being of the place where we live. We do that by engaging, don't we? Not by disengaging and just watching chaos spinning out of control, but we do that by engaging, praying, and seeking the peace. Proverbs says this: 
when the god I read this earlier, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked are in power, they groan. How can the godly be in authority unless the godly choose to participate, right? To participate and engage, okay? So Christians should seek to bring godly influence to bear on society in order to bless it. Number four, we should indeed pray for and intercede for our country and its leaders, and we should also submit to its authority. Again, when it doesn't contradict God's word, that's always without saying. First Timothy says this, I urge you then, he's talking to Christians, writing to Christians, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, we would say presidents, and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And then the Apostle Paul says this as well. Remind believers to willingly place themselves under the authority of government officials. Believers should obey them, and then listen, and be ready to help them with every good thing they do. We are to be engaged in the politics where we live. All right, number five then. We need to remember this so important. We need to remember that we are electing way more than just a person. We are electing a platform and policies and hundreds of appointees. Let me say that again, because I think that's so important from what I hear so many people say. We are not just electing a person when we vote for president or senator or whatever. We are electing a platform or policies that that person and that person's party are going to seek to put into place. And not only that, but that person, particularly a president, will appoint hundreds of people to positions of great power throughout the country. So you might be thinking, uh, when it comes time to electing, well, I, I like this person and I, I, li I don't like this person, right? Uh, this person's very handsome or this person's, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but that's not the way that we are to, to choose who we are to elect, right? We are to engage in the political process in order to bring God's kingdom to bear and his ethics and biblical ethics to bear on our world. 1 Samuel 16, 7, the people are looking to choose a king. They're looking at who's the tallest, who's the handsomest. God says, don't look at the outward appearance, right? Don't look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In other words, he digs deep to see what that person intends to do in their life. Now, God can see much deeper than we can. But with the help of Scripture and the Holy Spirit, I believe we can look at what people are proposing, what their policies are. We can look at their past and what they have done in the past. If they've been a governor or they've been a, a senator uh, and whatever we say, okay, they've done these kinds of things or, or they're talking about appointing these kind of people and then we can look at that person's track record and then we can stop focusing on a person and we can start focusing on uh, policies, right? Start focusing on what that person is actually going to do. Because you, you could have the most congenial, nicest person. I mean, that's what politicians are trained to do, right? So they spend 95% of their time doing is kissing babies, right? And shaking hands, right? Everybody likes them when they do that. But what are they actually going to do when they are in office? We are electing way more than just a person. We are electing and choosing a platform and policies for the next X number of years, four years or six years, right? And the hundreds of appointees, the, the people who follow particular ideologies that they will appoint to then exercise and carry out what they, their agenda, okay? Keep that in mind when you go to the ballot box in a couple of weeks. Number six, vote for those who will uphold, uh, who will most uphold laws and values of scripture and be people who live them out. Now listen, I understand that, that uh, most of our leaders, even though they call themselves Christian in name, uh, most of them are probably not sincere, devout Christians in the way that most of us in this room are, right? 
So they're not going to get up there and say we've got to enact all of the, you know, the Ten Commandments and all of these things that are in Scripture, right? But we can see what they will say. We're going to enact these laws and these laws that seem to align at least best with Scripture, okay? Closest. They might not be aligned perfectly, but, but which one is going to bring about the most, the closest alignment with God's Word, right? This passage here in 1 Samuel uh, God is speaking to the people through the prophet Samuel. He says this, if you will fear the Lord. He's talking, he's talking to believers, followers of God, right? The Israelites, but in our case, it would be Christians. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and heed his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord. And if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. The more we align ourselves with God and his word, and the more that our leaders uh, are, are more closely in alignment with that, the better off it is for our country. Okay? So six principles there. And you can go back, you can watch this again, or maybe you're writing these down. But I want to wrap up with this. I, I want us to look at some biblical considerations when voting, okay? Those are kind of like the, what we just talked about, the, the pre preliminaries, right? But what are some very practical, specific things that Scripture talks about, uh, that God elevates and highlights in Scripture, that we should also consider who we elect, who will most be in alignment with these things, okay? So here's the whole list, right? I'm going to break it down here for us, and we're going to look at Scripture. But who is, what are they going to do on the abortion issue? What are they going to do? Uh, for policies or pro-life? What the, what's their relation? What's their understanding of Israel? What's their understanding on immigration, legal immigration? We're not even talking about that, which is illegal. Uh, how do they treat the poor or the defenseless? What's their stance on the transgender issue, and particularly with regard to children? What's their stance on justice versus lawlessness? What's their stance on religious freedom? And what's their stance on the courts? Let's look at what Scripture says. First of all, the abortion issue, okay? Uh, Proverbs 6, 17, there's a list of seven things that God hates. One of the things that he hates that it says there is God hates the shedding of innocent blood. And I don't know about you, but is there any more innocent life in all of creation than the life in the womb? The people of Israel, they were judged. Part of the reason that they became exiled, that they got conquered by other nations, is because they disobeyed God. They began to follow the cultures around them. I've talked about this several times, where the people would follow the, the worship of Molech, right? And so part of that worship was to sacrifice your children in order to gain a benefit for yourself. And so they would literally, at that time, they would take their children, and there would be this giant statue of the god, a demonic god, Molech. It, there would be a fireplace beneath it. The, the hands of that, that god, that, that metal statue, would become uh, glowing hot, and the children would be placed into the hands and would be scalded and burned alive. And people thought that by sacrificing my children to God, I can gain some blessing for myself. I can get ahead in life. I can get some sort of blessing. Is abortion any different today? The scream is silent. And the people in the Old Testament times, it says that they would, they would dance around and they would sing and they would play loud instruments to drown out the cries of the children who were being sacrificed on that altar. Today, how many people sacrifice their children because, well, it's just going to slow down my career. I'm not ready yet for a child, or it's, it's going to have something, it's going to have a negative bearing on my economic status, or it's going, to, it's going to crimp my style or my freedom, right? They sacrifice their children on the altar of self-promotion, self-benefit. Now, again, let me say very clearly, if you've had an abortion, there is forgiveness for that. There is reconciliation and redemption for that. That child is in the hands of God. God welcomes you. He loves you. He wants you to go a different direction from that, okay? That's, that's why we warn. That's why we say this ahead of time. Don't go in that direction, okay? If that's happened to you, if you've made that choice in the past, you can be forgiven. Your life can be restored. God can do great things in your life, right? Begin following him now, okay? So first of all, which candidate is going to make it uh, uh, promote life in our culture vis-a-vis -vis the abortion issue? Number two, 
Israel. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. If you're familiar with this passage, the, the, the Abrahamic covenant, God says, I'm going to bless you and make you a great nation, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That ultimately came to fulfillment through Jesus Christ because he was a descendant of Abraham, right? Uh, but then he goes on and says, so whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, that is Israel, I will curse, right? We should be a country that is seeking to bless Israel. That doesn't mean we condone everything they do or have to agree with everything we do, but they have, they are, have a God-given right to exist by God himself. He created them as a nation. He called them as a nation. He continues to use them in our world as a nation. And so as we seek to align ourselves with God's word, we need to be a people who are blessing Israel. So which candidates, as we choose, whether it's the House or the Senate or whether it's president, uh, who is going to be that who is most likely to bless Israel and not curse Israel? The next one's immigration. Again, we're talking here legal immigration because illegal immigration is lawlessness. It goes against not only the laws of our country, but the laws of God, right? Immigration, the poor, and the defenseless. What does scripture say about that? Well, the scripture says a lot about it. I, I referred to it earlier when I talked about the prophets. They had to remind the Israelites so many times when they began to mistreat those who were sojourners in their land, right? Uh, what does it say, the scripture say about that? It says this. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. You can find all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is what the Lord says. And this is from Jeremiah 22, 3. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. We are to care for people. There's not to be a division amongst us. Those who are here, who are here legally who are abiding by the laws just because they might look different, sound different, talk different. We are to treat them the same. In fact, God's word, this is often overlooked in the debates that go on today when they try to bring up scripture, says this in Leviticus 24. This is the Levitical law. It says you are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. I am the Lord your God. In other words, uh, if you're here legally, the law should apply the same to you, right? You should be treated with the same justice and mercy and have the same recourse if something bad happens to you that a native-born person does. And then you can extend that to say, if you're here illegally and breaking the law, why should you get ahead of the, ahead of the line from somebody who did it the right way? The law should apply the same across the board, right? It's, it's not compassion uh, to apply the law in different ways. We're going to see that in just a moment when we look at the courts, okay? Almost done here. Number four, the transgender uh, issue and children in our society. Again, I've, I've spoken of this several times in the past where, where in scripture it talks about the abomination that is a man dressing or acting as a woman and vice versa, right? It's an abom abomination before the Lord. God made us male and female, Genesis 127. That's not to say there aren't like strange anomalies, okay? People born with two, there's been people born with two heads. That doesn't mean that's God's intention, Right? It's clear what God's intention was. So we can make allowance for somebody that has been born in a, with some sort of deformity. Uh, but, but God says we are not to have males acting as females and females acting as males. And worse, we should not lead children into that. I just saw this morning a, uh, um, uh, a Facebook post by Everett Piper. He was the president of Wesleyan, uh, in, in, uh, Oklahoma Wesleyan University. Uh, now he's a nationally known speaker. Um, and he just, he shared how, uh, I think it was six or seven years ago, uh, National Geographic had a transgender, I believe it was a transgender boy on the cover. And it was talking about, it was really kind of crazy, you know, oh, this is the future, all this kind of stuff. And he said, here, seven years later, now the, the, the story has come full circle. And this young man no longer identifies as a female and actually uh, now is, is, uh, has completely turned away from that. No longer wants anything to do with that and recognizes the, the dysfunction in his mind and the harm that was done by, as he took you know, the, the medicine that made, tried to make him into something that he was not, right? 
It's mutilating the children. It's harming the children. Jesus said it would be better for a millstone, in other words, a heavy weight, to be tied around your neck and you to be thrown into a lake or into the sea than for you to cause one of his little ones to fall into sin. Which candidates, as we come to choose, are going to protect children and to turn away the transgender agenda in our country? Next, justice and lawlessness. Romans 13 says this, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. In other words, there's nobody that's above the law. There's nobody can just choose to disobey the law or do what they want to do or, you know, uh, riot or tear down things. For there is no authority except that which God has established. In other words, even the authorities, even, even authorities we don't like, God has allowed them to be in place for a reason. So again, as long as we're not doing anything immoral, we are to be submitting to the governing authorities, which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Peter, I just were in Peter for the last couple months. Peter says this, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. It's right in our society to say that some things are wrong and should be punished. You can't walk into a, a, uh, uh, a drugstore and steal $999 worth of stuff and walk out and not be okay in society. That, that leads to more lawlessness. That leads to things spiraling out of control. So we, we, he says we are, uh, these authorities are sent. Their job is to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish peoples. When we live according to God's word, it silences the stupidity <laughs> and the ignorance of foolish people in our society. We are to engage. Then... Number six, religious freedom. How does religious freedom play into this? First Timothy 2, 1 and 2, Paul says this. We already read this, but he says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, and then listen to this, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. We need to elect leaders that are going to allow not only Christians, but other religions to have the uh, ability to exercise uh, their religion peacefully and quietly, right? That doesn't mean we agree with them. <laughs> that doesn't mean we think that, that, that all religions are equal and, and that all religions lead to God. They don't. Let's be very clear about that. But people, God in, imbued us and endowed us with freedom of choice. And so people have the ability to choose whether they will worship God or not. Our task, then, is to lead them to come to know the Lord in a saving way, right? But which candidates will lead to the uh, religious freedom? Finally, number seven, I think it is, yes, the courts, right? The courts in our country. There are, are thousands of courts around the country, not just the Supreme Court, but thousands of courts, and those we elect at the local level, make sure you know who you're voting for, for local judge. Uh, those who will be appointing judges, and particularly the president who can appoint or nominate those who will lead uh, the courts in our land. We should vote for those who would most uh, do what's in the line with scripture. Leviticus 19.15, God gives this law. He says, do not twist justice in legal matters by what? Favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. You notice there's two ends of that extreme, right? We, we have many in our society that really have swung the law around to, uh, to uh, we've got to twist the law to help, you know, benefit the poor, right? And make people, you know, do their whatever. Uh, but God says don't, don't favor the poor over others, but also don't be partial to the rich and powerful. In other words, always judge people fairly. Okay? So when it comes time to it, not just this election, but any election in the future, let these principles, ideas, values that God has, 
has revealed to us in his word, has instilled in his followers. Let them guide us as we vote. We're not voting for a person. We're voting for policies, right? We're voting for platforms for those whom they will appoint. So let me wrap it up with this. Let's say just a few things. Vote your conscience. Vote your conscience. Don't necessarily take what I say. I want you to, I want you to go and I want you to consider it. I want you to consider God's word and then to vote your conscience. The Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, you should, you should live out how you feel God calling you to live out uh, with, a, with a mind toward what he wants for you and trying to do that the best you can. And then don't judge others who do the same, right? I believe everybody in this room is trying to make the best decision they can for who they're going to vote for. Because we're all going to vote, right? <laughs> That's part of our civic uh, not just civic, but our biblical duty, right? We've talked about that. So then don't judge others who do the same if they vote differently from you. Because, listen to this, we will all have to answer to God. And if you look up Romans 14, 10 to 12, it says exactly that. We all have to give an answer to the Lord. I will answer for my choices in the voting booth. You will answer someday to God for your choices in the voting booth. And then finally, we're reminded to love one another and keep unity in the spirit. Do you believe that we can have some disagreements in this church body and still love one another? Do you think that's possible? Do you think that you could even disagree with me and still love me and I could still love you? I can tell you from my side it is very possible and it is the truth. So we are to love one another and keep the unity in the spirit. Paul puts it this way. As a prisoner for the Lord, then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle, right? Be patient. I love this. Bearing with one another in love. That means sometimes overlooking those things that, that irritate us or we disagree with about one another. But we are to bear with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our Father, this morning, uh, what a challenging reminder, what a profound responsibility you've given to us. Lord, it says in your word that you appoint, uh, you set up uh, kingdoms, you set up rulers, and you bring them down. And for us who are blessed to live in the United States in the 21st century, that authority has been passed to us as we get to participate in that by those whom we elect. I pray, Lord, that today, not just in this room, but all across this country, that you would speak clearly to people as we go into those voting booths, that we would vote what's most in accordance with your word, what's most likely to bring the most benefit and blessing uh, to the people of this country, not only this country, but the decisions we make and our leaders make have impacts felt around the globe. We want to be people who are people of justice, rightness, that our, our companies and our businesses act in ethical and, and uh, good ways, that our educational institutions teach truth rather than ideology. God, and, and may that start with us. Lord, I pray above all that our allegiance would be to you, that you would help us to love one another in Christ above all things. And uh, God, that you would bless this country. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me encourage you. Again, if you are uh, new to the church, please stop by the welcome table out here. We'd love to get to know you a little bit. If you have questions about anything I've shared today, you can see it online and watch it again. Or I'd be happy to take a call from you this week or talk to you in person. So please do that. We'll see you guys Wednesday night. God bless. Go in his name. Let's be praying for our country.